Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone in Kyoto. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening uh, for those of you joining online. Um, it's great to have you all with us. This session is on AI is coming, are countries ready uh, or not? And um, this week has been full of AI-related events, and I'm grateful that you've still got the stamina to join us uh, for this one. Um, this is a discussion that we really want to bring forward on how countries in different stages of their digital transformation effort are uh, taking the opportunity or, or, or trying to figure out the challenges around adopting artificial intelligence um, for the purpose of their national development process. Um, and so looking forward to a good conversation on this. I'll just, uh, my name is Robert Opp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer from the United Nations Development Program. Um, UNDP, for those of you who are not aware, is uh, essentially a big development arm of the UN system. We have presence in 170 countries. Um, we work across many different thematic areas, uh, including governance, um, climate, energy, um, resilience, gender, etc all for the purpose of poverty eradication. And our work in digital really stems from that because it is about how do we embrace the, the power of digital technology in a responsible and ethical way that puts people and their rights at the center of technological support for the development. Um, so, uh, w just to set a few words of context, um, I think obviously AI, especially with the advent of generative AI, has just exploded into the public consciousness around um, uh, what is potentially available for, for countries in terms of the power of technology. Um, and as we are in, sort of in terms of this, the, the state of, let's say, a pivotal point of history, three weeks ago we celebrated the SDG summit that marks the halfway point to the Sustainable Development Goals. We are not on track for the Sustainable Development Goals, unfortunately. Only 15% of the targets have actually been achieved. Um, some work that we, together with uh, the International Telecommunication Uni Union did in a report that was released called the SDG Digital Acceleration Agenda, um, we found that 70% of the SDG targets could actually be positively impacted with the use of technology. Um, and I have to say, during that week of the high-level segment a few weeks back of the General Assembly, there was a lot of discussion around digital transformation overall, the power of technology, and particularly, like here, the, the interest, the, I might say, the buzz around artificial intelligence and what might it do. But it's not so straightforward for countries um, to know what to do, where to turn, uh, for countries who don't have necessarily all of the foundations, uh, who are not aware of the models out there. And so the conversation today is really about how do we, um, what situation are countries in now, and what might we do to support countries as they embrace AI? What can, what can countries also do uh, to reach out and um, uh, organize themselves with the support of others. Um, and I think it's important to note that our view on this is really based in the opportunity. Um, a number of discussions this week have focused on the potential negative impacts of artificial intelligence, which is um, correct because there are lots of concerns. But on the positive side, when we look at this as UNDP, there is tremendous potential opportunity here to embrace AI and really um, make significant progress against the SDGs. And so the, the conversation today um, is about how to do that in a responsible and ethical way, um, but we're gonna focus a little bit more on the opportunity than um, the, the sort of doom and gloom end of humanity view, um, not that that's not important, <laughs> but. Um, okay, so for to, to join us today and, and joining us today and for really kind of giving some uh, texture to this round table. We've got a few uh, fire starter speakers with us, and we're very grateful to have a great mix um, of people that can really speak to this issue. So we have Dr. Ramesh Ranawana, who's the chairman of the National Committee to Formulate AI Policy and Strategy for Sri Lanka. 
That was uh, an entity that was established by the president this year. Um, we have joining us soon, hopefully, in, in the chair beside me, which is still empty, uh, Dr. Alison Gilwald, who's the executive director of Research ICT Africa, which is a, a digital policy and regulatory think tank based in South Africa. We have Denise Wong with us, who's assistant chief executive within the Data Innovation and Protection Group at Singapore's Infocom Media Development Authority, IMDA. Um, we have Galia Daur, uh, who's a policy analyst within the Digital Economy Policy Division at OECD's Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation. And we have Alain Indashimaye. I'm sorry, Alain, if I haven't got all of the syllables of your last name in there. Um, is, he was the project lead of the uh, Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution based in Rwanda. Um, and so my, my plan here is that we'll go through uh, some initial comments from all of our speakers, and then we do want to turn this over to you as well. Um, I'm also going to make it just a couple remarks from the UNDP side and some of the work that, that we're doing um, in this space as well before, just before we go to Q&A. Um, but the, the op offer to join us at the table is still open for those of you who'd like to come because it is a round table. All right, with that, um, let's go to our first speaker and, and you know, the setting here, or the, the overall question is, you know, are countries ready for AI? What are you seeing on the ground? Um, and what have the experiences been so far in building open, inclusive, trusted digital ecosystems that can support AI? And to speak first, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Ramesh Ranawana um, from Sri Lanka. Dr. Ranawana, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Robert, and good morning, good afternoon to all. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Sri Lanka has just embarked on this journey of, you know, trying to trying to improve AI readiness and and bring the bring the benefits of AI to 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 the general population. But but what we are faced here as a country with with very 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 low level of AI readiness and AI capacity is quite a gargantuan task, uh, mainly because the AI revolution is just starting. And if you look at where other countries are, we are we are we are significantly behind, and we, we need to catch up uh, to make sure that we bring the benefits of AI both to the people and our economy as well. And something that we've seen happening around the world over the last few years is that I think most countries have realized that building AI readiness, building AI capacity, cannot be done at a at a at, at uh, you know at the corporate level or the private sector level or by a few universities it's been it's it's been it's been accepted now that it's got to be a national level initiative that needs to take this forward and we've seen most of the developed countries have have have, uh, have formulated national ai strategies over the last few years and and most of the middle income countries as well especially over the last two years have have formulated policies so in sri lanka what we have is a is a strange situation where we have lots of engineers who are who are capable of building AI systems, and we did a we did a study recently where we found that just over the last year there have been more than three hundred projects in our universities conducted by university students on AI. But but the problem that we have is that very few of these systems or none of these systems are actually going into production. Uh, they are they are stopping at the stage where it's a proof of concept or a research paper, but it's not really going going into 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 society and actually causing benefits so 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 our, our our challenge here was how do we create an ecosystem where not only is the research done but also for some of these benefits to be brought out into government services into building economy to making uh, making you know food production more efficient bring it into education and things like that now the challenge that we have and and we are very fortunate that the government took the initiative to set up the presidential task force uh, to look at the national AI policy, and uh, our current trajectory is to uh, to launch the policy in November, and then a strategy uh, which will which will come up with the execution plan for the policy, which will come out in April 2024. But the challenge with AI is the fact that AI is a general purpose technology. AI can 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 affect just about any sector, from education to health sector to the national economy, government services, and as a country with limited resources, 
our challenge was how do we pick the battles that we want to address initially with our with our AI code. So we can't we can't do everything because our resources are limited, and and this this is quite a Herculean task. And as 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 the general uh, guidelines for how we want to approach this was, we had three main pillars that we were looking at. Uh, first, what are what were those foundation elements that we need to put in place to to build up AI readiness and AI capacity? Number two. What were uh, what are what are those specific applications and specific areas that we need to focus on that will cause immediate impact and also impact on the medium term? And third is also set up the regulatory environment on how we are going to how we are going to uh, you know protect our citizens from from the from the negative impacts of AI as well. And and for this, once again, the the bound the the scope is unlimited on what we can do and we've been very fortunate that the UNDP stepped in and and has been has started working on an AI readiness assessment for Sri Lanka which which we which which will be the foundation of you know setting out those parameters on what we need to look at uh, for what were those what are what should be our main priorities and focus areas for for the AI AI strategy that we are developing. So the AI readiness assessment at the moment is is underway, and uh, this AI readiness assessment will evaluate our strengths, our weaknesses, and the opportunities that lie ahead for 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 Sri Lanka in terms of AI. So as we as we stride forward, uh, our eyes are set on fostering an open and inclusive digital ecosystem that are not only that will not only withstand the shockwaves of the AI, the AI revolution, but also harness its potential for the greater good of our people. It's it's not going to be an easy task. I mean, developing a policy and a strategy is one thing, but I think the key element for Sri Lanka is how we are going to execute on this and also do this in such a way that it's sustainable, where this policy is not going to be put aside when governments change or you know the priorities of the government change. So that's something that we are also looking at on how we can approach that. But really, uh, our focus at the moment is first identifying our boundaries. What should the AI policy in Sri Lanka initially focus on? And then from there onwards, building on where we are going to go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranawana. Um, fascinating uh, questions to be asked, and I'm sure shared with a number of other countries. Um, we're going to go to our next speaker, uh, with, uh, Denise Wong of IMDA in Singapore. Um, and, you know, Singapore has done um, a lot very quickly, I would say, in the AI space. And, uh, you know, we're aware of some of the work you've done in policy and governance and how you've really worked to, to include putting people at the center, taking a human-centric approach. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about um, the approach Singapore has taken and some of the things you've done to, to make this a human-centric um, endeavor? Thanks for the question, and thank you for having me. Um, so you're indeed right. I think our policy has always been quite an inclusive one. Um, as part of the national AI strategy, uh, everything that we're doing today has really been on the back of building upon foundations about uh, inclusion uh, and about a high level of digital readiness and adoption within our communities. Um, and that's really been the bedrock for all the work that we've done after that. Um, sp focusing specifically on AI governance, which is the area that I work in, um, we, uh, of course, in the area of governance er and, and, and regulation, uh, you're always thinking about risks and, and potential of misuse, um, but I prefer not to see it only in that frame. A lot of it has been about what does AI mean and what does AI mean for the public good uh, in the public interest. And it's in that context that we see both opportunities uh, and um, op opportunities for our public at large, but of course with the appropriate guardrails and safety nets um, and implementable, guide, uh, implementable guidance. And thus, if I sum up our approach, it's really been about being practical um, and, and having detailed guidance um, to, to help um, shape uh, norms um, and, and usage. Um, and in doing so, uh, we started off with a model governance framework fully aligned to OECD principles, which was uh, very important to us to have the international alignment. Um, and we took a multi-stakeholder approach in developing that. Um, we also took an, a fairly international approach in doing that. We got feedback from more than 60 um, companies from different sectors, both domestic and international, um, as part of the first sort of iteration of the model governance framework. 
we also worked on what we call ISEGO, which is an implementation and self-assessment guide for companies. And that was actually done together with the World Economic uh, Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, and that helps to provide sort of practical alignment of, for companies with their governance practices uh, with the model governance framework. We also put together a compendium of use cases, uh, which contains illustrations on how local and international organizations can align and implement uh, these practices. So it was always a fairly practical approach that we took uh, an organization-centric lens, um, and that sort of took away the sting of uh, maybe politics or risk or existential and really just focused on what companies could do, should do um, to at the very sort of practical level. Uh, in the Gen AI space, I would say we've also been fairly sort of practical and industry focused. Uh, we issued a discussion paper um, in June focusing on Gen AI. Um, it was framed as a discussion paper rather than a white paper because we really wanted to generate discussion. Um, it was an acknowledgement that we didn't know all the answers. Um, no one does. And we wrote it together with a company in Singapore um, so that we had both perspectives. Uh, we've also launched the AI Verify Foundation in June. It's an open source foundation. Uh, to be honest, we're also learning how to do open source foundations um, as we go along. But that also has an AI uh, open source toolkit, uh, not in Gen AI space, in the discriminative AI space, but that was really a toolkit that we wanted to build and let companies sort of take and adopt adopt and adapt for their own use so that we are sort of lowered the cost of compliance for companies. Um, the AI Verify Foundation has um, over 80 companies now uh, who have joined us uh, from sort of all over the globe. And we did think that it was important to bring different voices to the table um, at the industry level, but also at the end user level to understand what were the fears and, and concerns that people had on the ground. Um, so it's been a constant sort of uh, conversation that we've had with our public and with our companies, uh, with international organizations, with other governments, um, all with the aim of, I guess, interoperability, gl global alignment, um, but also to sort of encourage a sort of open industry focused lens. Um, and that's sort of generally the way we have approached um, a lot of these issues in sort of uh, critical emerging technologies, frontier technologies, where we may not know what the answer is. Um, the last piece I'll say is that we've also been looking at the question of standards and benchmarking and evaluations, um, because a lot of that beyond the principles will be about that. What are those technical standards? And we do think that it is quite important uh, to have international alignment on that as well. Uh, and we do sort of hope that beyond general principles, that's where a lot of where the conversation will go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to turn to our third kind of country uh, focused example. Um, and uh, we're going to go to Alain Indashi and Ndayeshimaye, I'm sorry, Alain, you, you'll have to correct me on the pronunciation of your last name, I'm so sorry, um, who works at the, the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, based in, in Rwanda. And, you know, we know, th you know, as a Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, it's a, by nature a multi-stakeholder endeavor. And I guess my question for you is, what's the situation you see on the ground in Rwanda? And what's, how can multi-stakeholder approaches help with building the capacity of local digital ecosystems to engage in AI. Yes, uh, thank you, moderator. Uh, once again, uh, let me take the opportunity to greet every, everyone, uh, whatever you are in the world. Uh, before I contribute to this esteemed panel, allow me to extend my heartfelt gratitude to the UNDP team for inviting me to be part of this dialogue. As AI continues to shape our world, the need for responsible and transparent practices has never been more pressing. AI has the potential to transform societies on a global scale, but it also brings with it inherent risks, uh, if not developed, deployed, and managed responsibly. Uh, this calls for a multi-stakeholder approach in addressing these issues. So as introduced, my name is Alenda Ishimie. I'm the project lead for AI in the, and machine learning at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Our work revolves around identifying governance gaps for designing, testing, and defining governance protocols and policy frameworks that can be developed and adopted by government policymakers and regulators just to keep up uh, with the accelerated pace 
uh, of the benefits of adopting AI while minimizing uh, their potential risks. Uh, for Rwanda, AI is a leap for technology that through appropriate design and responsible implementation can help advance Rwanda's social and economic aspirations while becoming an upper middle income country by 2035 and a high income country by 2050. Even more, AI as a general purpose technology holds the power to achieve the UN sustainable development goals. In addition, AI has been identified as a driver of innovation and global competitiveness and this is as a result of the government's dedication of harnessing the power of data algorithm and as a catalyst uh, for so social and economic uh, change and transformation. So in response to the question posed to me, allow me to reference our journey in developing Rwanda's air policy as a case study. Rwanda often referred to as the land of a thousand hills is now apprising to be the land of AI innovation. With our national air policy now formally approved, we have set forth transformative journey uh, this policy isn't just a roadmap, it's a testament to Rwanda's vision and commitment to position itself as a beacon of responsible and inclusive AI on the global stage. However, its ambitious goals requires a strong foundation to build upon. And this is where we bring the concept of stakeholder collaboration at the forefront. And this is why we're established as a center. Our experience with multi-stakeholder approach has been both enlightening and transformative. Crafting and implementing our national air policy wasn't a solitary endeavor. It was a symphony of collaboration between the Ministry of ICT and Innovation of Rwanda, the Center for the Four Disaster Revolution, the public sector, international partners, academic, academia, the private sector, and civil society, collaborating uh, towards a common goal. These stakeholders brought different perspectives, experiences, and expertise, enriching the policy development process. The process of developing AI policy wasn't an inclusive and consultative one. The consultation and workshops were held, enabling stakeholders to share their insights, concerns, and ideas. By involving multiple stakeholders, the policy development process ensured transparency, accountability, and participation, resulting in a more comprehensive and robust policy framework. One of the key benefits of a multi-stakeholder stakeholder approach is the diversity of perspective it brings on the table. In the case of Rwanda's AI policy, Involving diverse stakeholders meant a holistic understanding of the current challenges and opportunities, resulting in a more nuanced, effective policy solution. The collaboration between stakeholders also helped build consensus and trust, fostering the sense of ownership of the policy among all stakeholders. Furthermore, multi-stakeholder pro uh, approach promotes a knowledge uh, sharing and capacity building among uh, stakeholders, ultimately strengthening local digital ecosystems. In the development of Rwanda's AI policy, stakeholders from different sectors and organizations shared experiences and knowledge, fostering learning and collaboration. This has not only resulted in a more comprehensive AI policy, but also heightened the capacity of stakeholders to effectively implement it. The multi-stakeholder approach has greatly aided Rwanda in establishing its AI strategy on a firm data governance foundation. As we all know, data serves as the lifeblood of AI, making robust data government uh, essential. Uh, by collaborating with stakeholders uh, through a thoughtful consultation, Rwanda's AI policy now encompasses a stringent data protection and privacy guidelines. And this aligns with the principles of the recently enacted Rwanda Data Protection and Privacy Law that will help co-design, which main, uh, mandates the safeguards and upholding of data privacy uh, of processing, of anyone processing uh, uh, data of Rwandan residents. In conclusion, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach has undoubtedly played a critical role in strengthening local digital ecosystems in Rwanda and building a foundation of, soul of our strategy. It has promoted collaboration, knowledge sharing, capacity building among stakeholders, resulting in a more comprehensive and effective AI policy. This approach has not only fostered inclusive and responsible development but of AI, but also builds on the trust and confidence among stakeholders, promoting sustainable and inclusive uh, growth of local digital systems. Furthermore, collaborative risk assessment informed by various stakeholders enables us to identify and mitigate any diverse AI-associated risks. Moreover, by collaborating with our international partners, we are aligned um, and aligned our local AI initiative with global best practices, ensuring that Rwanda is at the forefront of AI and both locally and internationally. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Over to you, moderator. Thanks so much, Alain. Um, some really uh, interesting observations there. And actually, the last thing you said was 
um, looking at what's happening globally. And that's actually where I'd like to turn the conversation now. Um, it, we have a couple speakers who um, are going to talk to kind of a zoomed out perspective and sort of looking overall. Um, so uh, with that, I want to turn to Alison Gilwald, who is the Executive Director of Research ICT Africa. Um, and you've been working across the African continent on uh, some research to understand where countries are with their AI readiness. Um, we've just heard an example from uh, the, the Rwanda case, but if you zoom out a bit, what are some of the takeaways that you're seeing uh, from the African experience so far with AI? Thank you very much. Um, so I think, you know, when we, when we speak about the digital readiness of AI, we're actually asking the same question as we did about the digi digital readiness for the data economy, the same questions we were asking about the digital readiness for broadband <laughs> or internet. Um, because in fact, many across the continent, many of those foundational requirements are still not met. Um, so many, many countries, um, you know, Rwanda, Lesotho, many, many countries actually have now 95% plus broadband um, coverage, mobile coverage, um, high-speed broadband coverage, and yet we have, you know, less than the sort of 20% critical mass that we know to see the kind of network, you know, network effects, the benefits um, of, um, of of being online, of broadband, of um, you know, associated with economic growth and those kinds of things. So they. You know, there's still um, analog, existing analog problems, um, and there are also still, um, you know, enormous digital backlogs. And what our research, so we do nationally representative um, um, surveys, uh, access and use surveys, they used to be, but now they're kind of very much more comprehensive, um, looking at uh, financial inclusion and platform work and you know, all sorts of other things. So they really give us a better sense of the maturity and the, the you know, what, what people are actually doing. Um, those uh, studies are done uh, across uh, several countries um, uh, in Africa, and what we see actually is that the real challenges around the demand side um, issues. So yes, you know, the, you know, the biggest barrier actually to the internet is actually the cost of the device, um, and you know, there are all sorts of associated policy issues around that, and you know, things that can be done. And then, of course, once people are online, you get this very minimal um, use of um, of, of da data of broadband because people can't afford it. Um, the affordability side is actually, you know, this is the demand side constraint. The pricing is the supply side. And that goes to our business models, our regulatory models, our lack of institutional um, capabilities or um, endowments to do some of the effective regulation you would need of these very imperfect markets. Um, but on the, uh, the real challenges are on the demand side. And, you know, all the kind of uh, aggregated um, gender data that you get that presents you know, this growing disparity between um, women and men, which is not true across all parts of the continent at all, um, is really around um, education. The thing that is driving access to education, whether you can afford that desire, device or everything, is, is education. Um, and that's from the, the modeling that we can do because these are demand side, um, fully you know, representative off the, net, off the census frame demand side studies. And of course, associated with education is income. So you know, people who are employed. And it's because women are concentrated amongst those who are less educated and employed. Um, in fact, the gender, if you can profit it on its own, is not necessarily a major factor. And then, of course, multiple other factors. So, you know, the much greater factor than, than gender actually is rural to location, rural um, lo location. But a number of intersectional factors that really imp impact people's participation. So a lot, you know, a lot of the uh, demand-driven new technology frontier strategies are looking at some of the supply side issues and of course are looking at the high level skills issues that you need, so, you know, short of data scientists or data engineers or that sort of thing. But it's actually, you know, it's this fundamental um, human development challenge, but also this fundamental ecosystem, you know, the economy and society that really has to be addressed fundamentally if we're going to be able to um, address these, these higher level issues. Um, so, they, you know, just questions of, of absorption. Um, even if we are thinking about um, trying to create, um, you know, public sector um, uh, data sets that could be used, the, pu the public sector um, you know, planning and purposes, so kind of building some public value out of this. Um, I think that's an important point that we need to come back to because I think a lot of the AI kind of models are driven by, you know, commercial value creation, which of course we desperately want. Um, on the continent, um, and the kind of innovation 
you know, discourse, which of course we want on the continent, but actually to get there and to get, make sure that that is you know, equitable, inclusive, just, um, requires that you know, some of these, uh, these other factors actually drive um, policy. And um, you know, basically the, the kind of absorptive capacity of your firms, the absorptive capacity of your citizenry. Um, you know, we see, for example, many, many countries with um, you know, now planning AI applications for government services, which you know, historically are, you know, if you've got less than 20% of your population connected, then you know, digital services become a, a you know, vanity project, <laughs> unless you actually can get people that can, you know, you, you can use these services uh, more effectively. And I think that's why the, you know, this, this enabling environment, these foundational um, requirements that we have are absolutely essential. And the, you know, we, we speak about it a lot in terms of the infrastructure side and um, uh, the uh, human development side of things, but the enabling um, legal environment, the enabling, um, you know, uh, human-centered, as you've called it, but, you know, rights-based environment, as we'll see as it plays out, um, is actually absolutely essential and foundations for, for building this kind of environment. And so I just briefly want to touch on, uh, because it might seem tendential to, the, to AI, but actually we think is an absolutely critical um, step um, in creating these conditions is the um, African Union Data Policy Framework, um, which has really created this enabling environment that you need. Um, the first half of the, of the framework really deals with these um, uh, enabling conditions I mean, we don't call them preconditions because we don't have the luxury of getting, you know, 50% of people online or, you know, the, the, the more than you know, the majority of your country with a digital ID or, you know, a, a data infrastructure in place. So these things have to happen, but they're very strongly acknowledged. Um, so there's a very strong um, component in the data policy framework that creates this enabling environment that has really leveraged the African continental free trade area in getting uh, member states, I think, to, to understand that unless they have this digital um, underpinning for the continental free tra tra trade agreement, which is a single digital market for Africa, um, they're not simply not going to be the beneficiaries of, of, a common, of a common market. And I think that's allowed uh, um, some leverage on that. But it's also allowed us to return to some of the um, challenges we've had around you know, a human rights framework, and I think there's, there's a, it's a high-level principle document, but there's a commitment um, to progressive realization of very ambitious, um, and I think, you know, um, absolutely laudable and, and good objectives that we, we now need to get to. There's an implementation plan, so there's countries can actually be supported. I think that's been our biggest challenge. Um, I, I think um, Sri Lanka was actually speaking about the, the, the challenge of implementation, being such great ones of the implementation um, strategy now. Um, but I think you know, the important part is that we can kind of we can come back to some of these foundational things that we haven't got right. The, you know, there's lots of talk about a trusted environment. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions from so-called best practices from elsewhere in the world that assume you know, institutional endowments, uh, regulatory autonomy, um, you know, competitive markets, uh, you know, digit, you know, skills and ability in, the, in these markets that simply isn't there. And I think you know, the document importantly points out that. Um, you know, tr of course, cybersecurity is important for, um, you know, for, for, for building trust, data protection. These are necessary conditions, but they're not sufficient conditions. And so the questions around, you know, the legitimacy of the environment that you're in, if, you, if you're wanting to build, you know, a, a kind of digital or financial system that's going to engage with a, a common market, these kinds of things all become really important. And so it's got very kind of uh, clear in the action plan alignment of, um, you know, uh, various potentially conflicting or legacy po policies that might be there. And of course, the big acknowledgement, which I will try and make the last point because I may have just run over. But I think, you know, the, the, the issues particularly with data governance, Sorry, the, the issues particularly with data governance but have implications for AI, very strong implications for AI, are that, um, you know, we're setting up a lot of uh, national plans. And of course, <laughs> that's all we can do at one level. Um, but essentially, these are globalized and we would argue, um, you know, digital public goods that we um, now need to govern through global governance frameworks. Um, a lot of the things we want to do, particularly the... Um, uh, you know, uh, safeguarding of harms 
uh, uh, very often, you know, we've got our local companies, we try to build local companies, but, uh, you know, 90% of the data that's um, extracted from Africa is, you know, goes out of Africa, it goes to big, big tech and big companies. So these national um, strategies have to be located um, globally. Um, and the other side of that, also from a global governance point of view, because we no longer can do this, which we would usually do with public interest regulation. And again, I think a lot of the focus is on the you know, the, the, the negative things of, 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 of AI, and so you've got to build this, um, um, you know, compliance regime, uh, harms, you know, protection compliance regime, is the lack of attention, which we do see in a lot of OECD um, work in this area, is about the economic regulation of y that you need of the underlying, um, you know, data economy, access to data, access to quality data, those kinds of things, um, you know, open data regimes, which are in the data policy framework governance component, um, um, by the way. But I think that in a lot of the discussions that we've had this week, a lot of emphasis on, on safeguards, harms, privacy, um, but not a lot on what you would ne really need to require to redress the uneven distribution that we see in opportunities, not just harms, which we do see as well, um, you know, between um, countries of the world, but also within countries. Well, speaking of OECD, we just happen to have them here, but um, Alison, thank you for opening up a huge can of worms there on multiple levels um, of global governance and things. We won't be able to get to all of those, but um, really interesting insight in the Africa uh, experience uh, so far. Um, so I wanna turn to our next and last speaker, for our kind of our initial set of speakers here, um, uh, Galia Dower, who's the, from the OECD, and um, you know OECD, as as Alison was saying, has done a fair bit of work in this space, and you've produced a set of AI principles, and I know you're working on toolkits and guidance and things like that. But maybe tell us a little bit more what you see from the global level here um, about what countries are asking for, what uh, the state of readiness is, just what you're seeing in general. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I, I admit it's it's a bit challenging to 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 speak after Allison on on, on that front, but I, I will try and I will try to do justice to um, the OECD's work, but also recognizing that there really are challenges, and and also I think not one organization um, or obviously not one country can can address all of them. So um, I think at the OECD we we come to this um, from the perspective of yes, a set perhaps of, of assumptions, um, but I think um, it doesn't it's not, it doesn't replace, I think, other work that, that needs to be done. So um, maybe just to, to sort of get in a bit into that work. Um, so the OECD started working on artificial intelligence in, in 2016. Um, and then in 2019, we adopted the, the first intergovernmental standard on artificial intelligence, um, the OECD AI principles. Um, and um, these, these are sort of a set of five values-based principles that apply to all AI actors um, and a set of five policy recommendations for, for governments, for, for policymakers. Um, the values-based principles um, are sort of about what makes AI trustworthy um, and also go into some of, of what other speakers have mentioned on the, the benefits of AI, but also the risks, and I think both are, are important. So um, elements like using AI for sustainable development um, and for well-being, um, also sort of having AI as human-centered, um, and as well as risks such as transparency, security, uh, importance of accountability. Um, separately, the, the, the policy recommendations, so um, I think perhaps um, linked to what Allison said without sort of prejudging the situation of any specific country, um, sort of looking at what, what a country would need to put into place in order to be able to achieve these things. So um, R&D for AI, but also the, the digital infrastructure, including data, um, including connectivity, um, the enabling policy environment, um, the capacity, the human capacity building, um, and of course international and multi-stakeholder collaboration, which is a point that um, of others have made already. Um, so the principles are now adopted by 46 countries and also serve the basis for the, uh, sorry, including Singapore, as was already mentioned, including other countries like Egypt, um, and um, also served as the basis for the G20 AI principles. Um, and as was mentioned, the, our work now is focusing on how to support countries in, in implementing these principles, so how to 
translate principles into practice. Um, and sort of looking at perhaps three types of actions that we're taking, so focusing on the evidence base. So one aspect is to look at what countries are actually doing, so looking at national AI strategies that countries around the world uh, are adopting. So we have a, an online interactive platform, the OECD.AI Policy Observatory, uh, that has already more than 70 countries in it. And what we've seen, for example, since we started this work, then at least of what we know, um, that 50 countries have adopted national AI strategies, which I think is, is an interesting uh, data point. Um, the observatory also has other um, data on AI, including sort of investment in AI in countries around the world, uh, research publications, so to see uh, which countries are more active in this space and, and what they're doing. Um, jobs and skills and sort of movement around, around the world of, of jobs and skills for AI. Um, so a lot of, of sort of wealth of information there. Um, we also have an expert group, um, that uh, a network of experts, uh, which is multidisciplinary and, and, and international uh, with sort of very broad participation. Um, and we're also developing sort of practical tools uh, to support countries uh, and organizations, sorry, I should say, uh, in implementing uh, the AI principles. Perhaps one last point that I would mention sort of in terms of what we're seeing um, with these principles now, um, then uh, one thing is we see that they are impacting uh, national and um, international uh, fra AI frameworks around the world with the definition of AI that's in the uh, OECD principles, but also our uh, classification uh, framework for um, um, AI systems. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is that um, we are also supporting countries um, if they're interested um, in sort of developing or, or revising their national um, AI strategies uh, to align with um, the, the AI principles. So this is work that, for example, we're now doing with Egypt. Uh, but I'll stop here and I, I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Galia. And the time is racing by. I can't believe it. We have about 15 minutes left in this session. And I'll do my best now to open up uh, for some questions. Um, and Jingbo, I wonder if you want to make a couple remarks as well, um, just to put you on the spot. Um, but before, so think of your questions now. Before I turn uh, to those, just to mention a, a, a couple things from the UNDP side. Um, we um, are doing digital programming or supporting digital programming in about 125 countries, um, 40 to 50 of which are really kind of looking at national trans digital transformation processes and some of those foundations that Allison was talking about because we really see the importance of building an ecosystem. It, it, this, is, this is doesn't happen with fragmented solutions. This happens when you build the kind of foundational ecosystem that is comprised of people, uh, the, the regulatory side, the government side, the business side, and so on and so forth, as well as your underlying connectivity and affordability. Um, and we've started also to kind of uh, an additional process to that, which we, we're calling the AI readiness um, process, that basically can complement that. And it really looks at, um, and this is what Dr. Uh, Ran Ranawana was talking about, um, where we've been working to support Sri Lanka, um, Rwanda and Colombia currently on looking at w how does government serve as an enabler and how is society set up in terms of being able to handle um, artificial intelligence in terms of capacity and some of those foundational issues. Um, and this is something that we have been doing. It's been piloted together with um, or in the auspices of an interagency UN process that's led by ITU and UNESCO um, and something that, that we hope will be a um, one of the tools that are available to countries in the toolkit as they seek to address these issues, um, taking that kind of ecosystem approach. So um, if there are any, any of you who are representing national interests here and would be more interested in that, please let us know. Um, with that, I, th I think I'd like to turn over. Jingbo, I was pointing to you because um, Jingbo Huang is the uh, director of the UN University in Macau and has a research uh, initiative focused on AI. And I if you want to take the floor, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you had any quick observations, and then I'll uh, turn to some questions. We've got a question here and a couple online. Is that okay? I didn't warn you before, I'm sorry. Thank you, Robert. 
I'm here to learn. Uh, my name is Jingbo. I'm the director of uh, UN University Research Institute in Macau. So we are a research UN organization, and uh, our work is mainly related to, you know, AI governance. So, for example, we we, we conduct research, uh, training, and education from the angle of uh, uh, the biases uh, within related to gender, children in the algorithm, and we have done research uh, with uh, in collaboration with uh, some UN organizations. Um, for example, UNESCO, ITU, UN Women, and soon to be for hopefully with UNDP. So I, I'm really here to uh, have an open mind to learn about uh, the uh, uh, this topic. And I actually saw a very nice uh, overview and pictures from Africa, from uh, Asia, from OECD. So it's really a great learning. Uh, so the, 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 the one keyword that comes into my mind is a collective intelligence and is not only uh, the collective intelligence between people and people. And we, we talk about regulatory framework, uh, business, we have uh, all these entities among human to work together to make this uh, infrastructure ready. And we're also talking about machine intelligence, if we call them intelligence, and the human intelligence working together. How are we taking it? Like what Robert, Robert has said at the beginning, it's not only about the dark side. So uh, how do we uh, bring these, uh, the bright side together. So the collective intelligence is uh, the key word um, that just emerged in my mind. Uh, so I have uh, like two questions um, since I'm learning here. So the first question is, uh, is uh, related to the different tools and the, um, and the frameworks that the OECD developed, that Singapore developed, and uh, maybe Africa also has developed, and also UNDP. So how do these tools work together? For example, uh, I just learned the concept of uh, uh, UNDP's AI readiness um, assessment tool, and now I heard about your different tools. How do, do these tools work together? Uh, or maybe they don't. Uh, so this is the first question. Second question is to all the panelists about uh, what keeps you awake at night now? Because this is important for me to learn what are the challenges you're facing right now in this implementation process, in this conceptualization process? Uh, I have the overview, but I want to know the pain points. Thank you. All right, we're gonna quickly just go to a couple questions here so that um, we then will have time for response from panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alke Alke Pals, uh, and I work for KPMG in the responsible AI practice. Um, and first of all, I was triggered by this session title. Uh, and so you did a good job on uh, with the session proposal. Um, and um, so I work for KPMG the Netherlands, but uh, also coordinating our efforts uh, globally. Um, and what we see is a large difference in um, in countries just uh, acting as uh, in a democratic way itself, and um, also being part of the ethics work stream, um, yeah, really gives me a, a broad view of of the entire world actually, as uh, certain countries that are having no uh, no democratic processes in place, others do. Um, so with our advisory practice, it's really difficult to. Uh, to advise on ethics with a country that has uh, yeah, has no clue what what's that about to to be a little bit uh, um, yeah proactive about that. Um, so th that's really difficult. So uh, asking your question, um, are countries ready? No, definitely not yet, because coming from the Netherlands, we also see uh, even issues in our own country, which uh, relatively is quite democratic um, however yeah so we really really need to uh, cooperate together and also thanks to the OECD guidelines and principles they really uh, function well and we use them uh, in our daily uh, daily work and daily basis uh, and also happy to con contribute on uh, next iterations if uh, if possible um, but yeah, that these are my observations from uh, from the outside. Thanks. We're going to take one more question here. We'll go online quickly, um, and then I think we'll just have chance for panelists to come back once, and then we'll close. Armando. Oh, hi. Um, I am Armando Mansueta from the Dominican Republic. Uh, 
First of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, well all the organizations for doing this uh, amazing session. Uh, all the all the people that were intervening uh, have done a remarkable uh, point regarding AI for development in this case. Well, um, there's a thing here with AI, and it's the way that it's being promoted by the companies, by the international organizations that are promoting that AI will transform the world and that will change everything, which is uh, actually right. But there's the thing that in the race uh, to become AI proficient at all at all levels in most nations, especially in the global south, has been taken into, I must say, not necessarily the right direction. Because we're focusing on implementing, um, and implementing uh, algorithms, implementing solutions that are AI infused to do a myriad of things, uh, especially in government. But uh, the main problem is that we don't have uh, the core elements for doing an a, a transition to an AI-based society just yet. It's starting with data. So uh, we have problems with uh, data quality, with data collection, uh, with the how we assure that the data is, uh, is correct so we can prevent biases. And of course, we don't have the infrastructure in place, and yet we most, most of the countries have inadequate data protection and privacy laws and regulations. So, uh, given this situation and knowing, uh, and knowing the, how things are moving and how things are approaching, how do we uh, propose or create a set of rules, a set of frameworks that uh, helps the, help to guide the countries into the right direction regarding data? Because when we talk about AI, we're really talking about large language models, which is just data. So if the data is not right, how we can implement properly AI solutions that actually help our country to develop? And this is most, moreover the question that in the Global South we're asking now. Dominican Republic. <laughs> Thank you, Armando. Um, okay, let's go online very quickly because we are really running out of time. Um, and I'm going to turn to my colleague who's on my team, uh, Yasmin Hamdar, who's been moderating online. And Yasmin, I'm sorry to make you do this, but can you just uh, pick one question uh, for, for the, and I know you've got more than that, but just pick one and ask, please. Of course, thanks, thanks, Rob. So we have one interesting question. Um, given the rapid advances in AI capabilities, how can governments ensure that its technical infrastructure and workforce skills are agile enough to adapt to new AI technologies as they emerge? Okay, how to make sure the workforce is agile enough, which is related, I think, to many of these. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to our panelists. Um, and I think this, unfortunately, will have to be our closing round as well. And I think Jingbo's given a good question that I'd like all of you to answer, which is what keeps you awake at night. Um, but if you'd like to speak as well to the questions about um, the, the tools, I will also have a response on, on that one. Um, also the issue of, you know, this sort of um, how do we get the fundamentals right? How do we get the, the right data? Um, and those kinds of things. How do we work toward a collective intelligence? Uh, Dr. Ranawana, uh, can I just turn to you first for your, your brief responses, please? Of course. Uh, uh, I mean, essentially the, the problem is, like, like it's been mentioned so many times, are, are the foundation elements. And, and for us, one of the, one of the biggest obstacles to, to take our AI ambitions forward and also to, to provide the benefit to the people, especially in terms of government efficiency, corruption, making making things more available. Sri Lanka is fortunate that we have good connectivity and and about 90% of the population does have uh, connectivity available to them, but the lack of data, I think has been highlighted so many times is probably our, our biggest problem. Data is extremely siloed and it's it's still available in paper format in a in a lot of situations. So how to how to first digitize it, standardize it, and then make it available to those who need it in a fair and responsible manner is probably our biggest challenge now. And and that's not only a technical challenge, but also an operational challenge. It's changing mindsets, awareness, uh, trust in these systems, and and that's something that you know, we are, we are really struggling with on, on how to take that forward. Thanks so much. Is that what keeps you awake at night? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> that, that is definitely one of the big ones because, like I said, we have so many people doing AI projects, but they're running AI projects on data that they download from the internet. You know, it's data related to other countries. We don't have projects running on Sri Lankan problems, 
because we just don't have those have those problems available. So all these efforts being being wasted because because we don't have a you know consolidated set of data sets to yeah. to address national problems. Thanks so much, uh, Alan. Let's go to you next. What keeps you awake at night? So the technical development and deployment of AI is uh, so here I'm referring to ethical considerations when developing and, uh, and actually deploying these technologies is what uh, often keeps me up at night. Um, concerns around risk associated with technology such as biases in AI models, uh, potential privacy breaches, and, and broader society impacts such as job displacement and misuse of AI in areas such as surveillance and autonomous weaponry uh, are one of the things that actually keep me at night. So ensuring that AI is used uh, responsibly and benefits uh, all societies paramount and it's a challenge that requires continuous uh, vigilance and adoption. And uh, please allow me to also uh, talk on how, uh, there was a question around how these uh, instruments need to work together. So let me speak on harmonization, uh, especially in the African context. Uh, harmonizing policy and regulatory efforts among African countries is not only pivotal for uh, their robust participation in the global uh, digital economy, but also provides a unified front when dealing with large uh, multinationals that are the center of this global digital uh, data economy transformation. Uh, such harmonization efforts uh, force economic integration, enabling smoother cross-border trade and investment, and promote standardization, reducing complexities of different regulation. It also facilitates uh, the de development of shared digital infrastructure, ensuring connectivity across regions. A unified strength, uh, uh, Africa's voice in global negotiations, ensures a better representation of its interests. By addressing uh, shared digital challenges collectively, Africa can uh, de devise effective solutions, attract global tech giants through a uh, consistent regulatory environment, and spur innovation. Um, furthermore, harmonized approach ensures uh, the continent's wide uh, consumer protection, robust data privacy standards, and boosts African competitiveness in, digital, in the digital realm. In an essence, a uh, coordinated policy framework is essential for Africa to leverage uh, the digital economy uh, and benefits and positions itself as a significant player uh, within this space. So thank you once again for this opportunity. Over to you. Thanks so much, Alain. Um, Denise, let's turn to you. Uh, what keeps you awake at night on this issue and any other comments you want to make? Thank you. I think on a global level, I worry about fragmentation. I think we've been in a space uh, for, for a long time now in different areas where global laws are fragmented um, and that just raises compliance costs for everyone. Um, so I think we have an opportunity to do it right and have that conversation early um, and, and we should try and do that. I think at a more domestic le level, I worry about leaving vulnerable groups behind, um, even in a society that's highly connected and highly literate like Singapore. Um, there's always that fear um, that technology will widen divides um, and, and create harms that we cannot anticipate to groups of people uh, that we should be protecting the most. Um, I, and I guess the third thing I worry about is cultural sensitivities and ethnic sensitivities, um, especially with black box technology, it's hard to predict um, whether the technology is going to um, fragment and divide or it's going to unify and cohere. Um, and so part of what we do is um, to try and unpack what it means from a culturally specific lens. Um, and uh, that is really about AI for the public good. Thanks, Denise. I think we'll, I'll turn to Alison. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, it, what keeps me awake at night is the you know, inevitable implication of inequality unless we address some of the underpinning <laughs> you know, structural inequalities that are leading to this. Um, and I think you know, that's very likely if we simply take these blueprints and uh, take them from you know, countries with completely different political economies, conditions, and just implement them onto, uh, onto these societies. And you know, just in that regard, <laughs> I have to sort of say that you know, although the, uh, the challenges of having de democratic frameworks within to developing AI policy is obviously a, a challenge for many of us, but I think we really need to appreciate that actually the ethical challenges that we are facing are with some of these biggest tech companies that come from, at least some of them, come from the you know, biggest democracies in the world. So I think the ethical um, you know, issues should um, be addressed globally and can be addressed globally. And just finally to say that you know, the point that was being made about we, we can't actually unbias these big data sets because we d 
the countries like um, Sri Lanka was mentioning, the countries aren't digitized, people are not online. We simply can't unbias the invisibility, the underrepresentation, and the discrimination that we're seeing in our world currently. Kalia. Um, yeah, so very quickly, just to say, I think um, I, I can really relate to a lot of the things that um, Denise said about the, the fragmentation, and, and this, is, this is a real concern. Um, I think what keeps me up at night is also that we will miss out on the opportunities that AI has to really, that I think ultimately have the potential to make everything better for everyone if we do it right and I think it's 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 too big to miss and that's that means that it's something that we can't leave to com just companies we can't leave to a certain set of countries which I guess leads me to this has to be uh, and because AI itself is global because it has no border then it has to be a collaborative effort and that needs to be genuinely collaborative and I think this is a good it's not a start because we've been in that process for a while but I think this this kind of conversation is really important thanks thanks Galia and thanks to all our panelists and just we're we're over time and I'm sure we're gonna yeah <laughs> I'm getting the nod um, but I, I would just say a couple things to try to sum up what I've heard um, and to add a little bit of my own insomnia or sleeplessness um, to this um, you know, I think we've heard that there are certainly the challenges here, and the challenges that have been named are things like fragmentation and the, the foundations, and it's import so important to get the foundations right, which is hard. You know, it, this is not a, a simple process. Um, it involves a lot of moving parts and a lot of complexity and a lot of issues around financing and everything else. Um, but we have to do it, and countries, we have to help countries uh, get there, and I'm talking to myself. <laughs> That's partly our, our role. Um, but, um, and, I, and I, if I sort of add what keeps me awake at night, it's very similar to what um, is being mentioned here. If we, as the United Nations system, stand for leaving no one behind as part of the 2030 agenda, then if we say that artificial intelligence is a major opportunity for humanity, um, but artificial intelligence is only as good as the data behind it and the training behind the data, and or the training of the data, and the production of the algorithms. So how are we going to ensure the representation and diversity in the underlying data sets and the models that are put forward? Because these will not be culturally relevant to everyone's worldview. We work with indigenous communities across the world, with um, thousands of local languages. These, the, these represent different worldviews and human development is not about everyone becoming the same. It's about every human realizing their own potential. So I, that being said, the opportunities here are that um, I think what we've heard over and over again is the multi-stakeholder approach is really critical. And if we're gonna bring in those worldviews, where it's going to have to be a, an intentional consultative process. And I think being human-centered in all of this is a method of risk management. This is a way to ensure that we build the basis and the foundation that we really need. Um, and I know I'm missing out some of the nuanced points that were made, but uh, I'm really very grateful for all of you for, um, first, our, our panelists for having spoken today and um, giving us some insights, and for all of you who've joined us in the room uh, as well as online. Um, and please do uh, reach out and, and uh, to us at UNDP or the other um, panelists in their organizations for any other questions um, or support that we might be able to give, um, and we will get through this together. So thank you very much. Um, please give ourselves a round of applause.